uh, as I introduce Karsten, who will be talking to us today about 3D and CGML. to smart cities, future cities, I think we have to acknowledge perhaps to start with that, I think at least that, that cities are an evolutionary success. And I think this is underpinned by a lot of material that, that, that we've seen that we are actually in a city, a very big city, the biggest metropolitan area um, in the world, I believe, right now. And I think it's actually quite amazing how well cities work, at least to a certain extent. So when I got here last night, um, just before, for midnight, I was kicked out of the plane, never been to Japan before. I kind of stumbled through immigration. Everybody was smiling at me. I got onto the, to the metro system. Um, obviously, I can't read Japanese, but I still was able to get from Haneda to here in kind of half an hour's time. And I figured, this is really efficient. So there's something in cities that actually really makes cities work. And if we talk about the definitions of future cities, of smart cities, I think what we've learned this morning is that they are incredibly complex. And I think everybody is probably struggling, at least to a certain extent, with what smart cities mean and how we, from a geospatial perspective, um, can actually relate to smart cities and can add <coughs> values to smart cities. And what I'm trying to do this morning is to hopefully bring a little bit of simplicity around this. And in order to do that, I'm not going to start to talk about uh, technologies like 3D and, um, and CityGML to start with. But just have a look at the, the areas, the use case areas um, that, that I think are important when it comes to, um, to, to cities in general. So let's start with a fairly, fairly big picture view. Um, there are a number of items that are important for, for life, and these are um, the main elements to start with. And these are all obviously present in a city, these in a way make a, make a city work. So there's air. We all need, need air to breathe and to, to live. There's fire, and if we can take fire as energy, I think we all know that we need um, energy to operate at least the, the kind of lives that we have accustomed and even in much, much more basic and um, more primitive forms of life, energy is, energy is an important thing. And of course, we need water. And in some societies, in some environments, we take water for granted. But I currently live in Dubai in the United Arab Emirates, which is a, is a desert. And water is actually more expensive than, um, than gas or petrol in this, um, in this environment. And it obviously relates to energy because um, water is a function of energy because in order to get water, um, the most efficient way to do this is, is salt water desalination. So all these things are, are quite, quite connected to each other. We need food. We probably won't eat rape seeds, but um, find kind of like the, um, the picture here. And the point was made this morning by, by Chris, I think, that the overall ecosystem is not just the city, it's also the environment, the wide environment that, is, that the city is in. And again, if I can give you the Dubai example, there's probably virtually no food growing in the city other than kind of a few million dates that they harvest e each year. And also in the wider United Arab Emirates, um, the amount of agricultural production is actually quite, quite limited. It gets a little bit better if it goes into, well, uh, into the oasis where there's, um, there's um, some production, into the mountainous areas you can actually grow potatoes and tomatoes and, and there are a lot of locally grown cucumbers, but that's about it. So virtually all the food that's consumed um, by kind of six, seven million people in the entire country comes from outside. And I guess there is a big question mark around sustainability on, on that front. So let's move a little bit more into, into location because there's land that we need in order, in order to live as well. And I think this, this image illustrates quite nicely 
that um, on this land there are obviously people, and what you see here on this uh, on this map is a quite implicit depiction of, of um, well of an urban map. It shows you where the people are. It shows you that in quite an indirect way by the by the light sources, and um, I guess I guess it's quite easy to spot where this is. So it's the, the kind of top part of of Egypt, and at the end of the day, it probably doesn't really matter whether. Um, we talk about a city which is the blob here, which is Cairo, or the Nile Delta, or um, the river area, which is quite quite populated, populated there. What this image shows, and this is, I think, why geospatial technology is so important um, um, in this respect, is that the resources are distributed in quite an unequal way, and that's, I think, a, a common principle around the world. And it has also led to population being concentrated um, in certain areas, so that the distribution of population and resources is quite unequal all over the world. And this makes location really, really important. And it's the access to resources and the way that we, that we utilize resources. Um, this is, I think, where this whole notion of sustainability comes in, and this is where geospatial technology can really add something to um, the overall notion of smart smart cities. But then there are people and there are communities, and I think there's a very important social aspect uh, to smart to smart cities as well. So what does it mean in terms of the use cases? And when I say use cases, I mean more the kind of larger areas of use cases rather than very specific ones to start with, where we can hopefully add value um, with geospatial technology. So you see in the kind of macro areas, air, water, fire, energy, food, people, which should probably include transport, social, uh, which um, should include transportation. I think these are all areas where geospatial technology um, can add value. Now I've taken these, these, um, these areas and tried to order them in a slightly different way and came up with, um, with this listing. And the resource ones probably fall into the categories you see up here in terms of environment, transport, energy, infrastructure in general, food, housing, emergency, and resilience. And they may not come as a surprise to you. I think all of these areas were mentioned one way or another, or another this morning. But then there's a second category, and we move really away from resources and start to think about things like economy, <laughs> We um, start to think about experience. So going back to kind of my coming in from the airport, that was pretty good experience, and that had to do with location, and that had to do with with cities and communities. Responsibility, perhaps responsibility of, of individuals and, and groups for sustainability, as well as a notion of competitiveness. And I think this is a really interesting point because we see an increased level of competition between cities around the world to provide an attractive living environment for their citizens, to attract the right talent, the right people into the cities, um, and to, pro or to, to attract the, the level of investment that would actually allow um, a city to grow further. And maybe one can ask the question why or if it's really necessary for cities to grow, um, to grow further, but that seems to be a phenomenon that everybody is, 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 is quite, quite keen on. So we have, in my mind, kind of two, two areas where geospatial, geospatial technology could play in the smart cities context, and that is the optimization of, of resources and optimizing process that basically <coughs> utilize the resources, and that, that includes a number of social aspects as well. So let's have a look at one more specific use case of how um, well, let's say we try to be reasonably smart, at least um, in the UK, when, when it came to the uh, London 12, 2012 Olympics that were run two years ago. And in that environment, your spatial technology and the data, mapping data information, was actually used to, to an extent that probably exceeded um, many of the things that we've done before. And we started looking at the Olympics with saying, yeah, there, there's a lot of infrastructure investment in the Stratford Olympic Park that you see here. And it would be quite beneficial throughout the construction phase of the Olympic Park to, to track the progress. 
And that's what we've actually done. So over um, a period of a number of years, we actually captured the aerial photography for, uh, for the Stratford area 14 times. So what we have is a very high resolution uh, in terms of <coughs> spatial accuracy and also reasonably high resolution in terms of, of, of time sequence um, snapshot of the development of the Olympic Park. But that was really just the, the start of things. We, in the run-up to the Olympics kind of a few years before, we looked much, much more about how data, how information would come together and how that could be utilized in basically three different, uh, three different phases of the Olympics. And that was um, the construction and planning phase, that was the operational phase, and that was the operational phase from an authority's perspective, so the organizations running the Olympics, as well as the user experience. Uh, experience. And geospatial data was used heavily in all of these three phases. And whilst I won't want to go into this in detail, um, the information um, collation that went on and how this information was actually um, connected and channeled, um, yeah, was actually quite um, quite good and quite quite comprehensive. So we had various data feeds from the organizing committee in London, um, the base mapping data which came from Ordnance Survey, as well as um, stakeholder data from quite a number of other government agencies, which were all integrated into a spatial database which served as um, um, as the central as a central repository. But then through a kind of middle layer of services, data was made available, or different aggregations of data was made available to a variety of these different stakeholders um, to, um, to solve um, or to support a number of, of processes, such as modeling and analysis, more detailed um, design of Olympic infrastructure, and, and so on. So I'll give you a few examples of how that, how that worked. So organizing an event that was as big in the Olympics in a fairly busy and mature city like London where, in simple terms, there isn't much space to put um, a lot of additional infrastructure, particular in transportation and other in a greenfield or actually brownfield development site such as the Stratford Olympic Park. It was realized that the Olympics just had to work within the city and pretty much all parts of the city. So what you see here is one of the um, more detailed designs that we um, that we help developing on traffic infrastructure and how um, the traffic patterns and the um, traffic flows were actually changed throughout the Olympics. So we had um, an Olympic route network which, which provided kind of priority transportation for for kind of the officials and the and the sport people. Um, a lot of work was done on, on visitor flows and so on. So geospatial information was really at the heart of designing. Um, yeah, different flows of, of, of people and transport throughout the city. That didn't really stop within London, there were events held outside and on routing um, kind of vehicles for, 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 for officials and, and sports people, there was a lot of work done in the rural areas um, around it. On the communication front, there were issues or um, concerns about um, giving the right information to particular locals of how the traffic patterns were changed. And again, this was, was, um, was designed using a lot of geospatial information and, and maps. We also enabled the third dimension. We didn't go completely overboard two years ago in, in doing this. So what you see here is what from a city GML perspective would be called a, um, an LLE1 model. So a reasonably simple, simple block model. Um, so that was used by the uh, Metropolitan Police Services in, in particular. And whilst this is by no means the most exciting 3D picture that you've ever seen, um, the recent developments, kind of what happened after 2012, is that we actually made that level um, of, info, of information, kind of the LOD1 3D, available for the whole of Great Britain. So that, that means 25 million, million buildings. So rather than going kind of up too fast, or what we thought might be too fast in providing very detailed 3D. We actually worked on a national coverage perspective to say, for the entire country, we want to um, enable 3D in terms, of, in terms of buildings. So in a way, that's the, that's the Ordnance Survey approach to, um, to, to making information available. 
And then to round it up from a visitor um, experience perspective, um, the same geospatial information that was used for, for planning and operations was then also utilized to provide a better visitor experience by creating these products and that include iPhone application, that include these billboards that basically um, give people a sense of, of, of locality and tell them uh, where to go to experience certain, certain things. An important point in this is that what geospatial technology really facilitated is collaboration. Yeah, it enabled certain processes to, to do analysis better, to um, what we did, did is a lot of predictive analysis on, on traffic patterns, like um, to suggest detours um, for people to say at 7 p.m. today we expect a particular tube station to be really at the limits of capacity. Um, don't go there, just go to the to the next one, which is on a <coughs> on a different line. But the real success success in how we utilized your spatial information was to facilitate collaboration between all the, the agencies in London and um, beyond London that you um, that you see there. And we found that geospatial technology, in particular data, is very powerful in doing this. So this is what we've done a little bit more than two, two years ago. How smart was that? Was that kind of geospatially smart in any way? And I would say yes, that was quite smart. And for me, that is a bit of proof that says <coughs> we've done smart city stuff actually for quite some time. GIS technology, geospatial data, has played in what we could describe smart cities for, I don't know, perhaps 5, 10, 20, 20 years, maybe even a little bit more. But the example that you saw there was pretty much still the project environment. So we've created a lot of additional, very detailed data for the Olympics in particular that we weren't able to maintain after that because it was simply too, too expensive to do that. To, to do that. And a lot of the data that flowed into it was quite static. So we had a fantastic representation of the built environment. We had some predictive data about how people would move around, for instance, but um, we didn't have any real-time data on where people were. And these days, it's reasonably easy to get access of these data through um, kind of the mobile network operators who can basically tell you where the mobile network subscribers are um, in the network or on the ground. So I would like to offer you one definition of a smart city, which is it's kind of doing everything that we did in London 2012, but moving that out of a project environment into kind of um, a op completely operational environment, where that is there all the time, and also to enable um, live sensor data and really allow real-time analytics and be able to, um, to, to, to react to developments in, 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 in real time. I have a second definition of, of smart cities, and this comes from, from a webinar um, we did a few, um, a few months ago. And I think smart cities are real, really characterized, or the, the IT part of smart cities and the way the word is, or the, yeah, the term is used these days, is about the availability of information, and that means a lot of information, and the exchange of this information between different parties. So ubiquitous data being available, almost waiting for, for uh, waiting to be used. But then there's also a notion that we can use technology to make life better, safer, and also more sustainable. Now that's obviously quite a technical viewpoint, and that's not necessarily the only viewpoint in the smart smart city. I think Mitch had quite a good slide um, saying that the solution is perhaps only part technology. Um, it's also policy and how we actually change change behaviors, and I think we should always recognize that, that technology isn't the, uh, the sole answer to, to any problems. <coughs> and then the third point is to reinstate the importance of, of collaboration. And a smart city should be an environment in which really different players, different stakeholders from different areas such as private and public sector, um, as well as citizens actually work quite, quite closely together. And I think there is a there's an idea, at least, that geospatial technology and data can, can facilitate that. So if you move a little bit f further to say, what from, from a smart city, what, what might be a smart city that is geospatially aware? 
Uh, and this is an area where a lot of the, the topics that, are, that, that we typically deal with in, um, within OGC come, come in. So it's giving geospatial context along the lines of everything happens, happens somewhere. It's making core reference information about particularly the built environment available in 2D and 3D. And we shouldn't really forget about 2D because a lot of investments have been made, particularly by governments, but also by private sectors around the world, in creating 2D data. And the last thing that we want to do in 3D is to say, well, let's forget about the existing 2D data. We're going to create something that is new and shinier and better. So in my mind, 2D is kind of almost the most important ingredient to, uh, to a 3D virtual environment. But also, items like addressing are important. You need to identify where you want to go. And if I can come back to a Dubai example, which is often quite good in terms of stuff that's missing, um, Dubai doesn't have an address system, so it's, it's uh, quite impossible at times to actually find where you want to go. Um, much, much easier in, in Tokyo, and even without an address to, to operate, um, that the instruction was basically go to the station, turn out right at the access, and you have the hotel straight in front of you, which did the trick. But when it comes to information integration, items like, like identifiers become, become really, 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 really important. And in the, exchange, in, in the exchange of information, it's quite important to actually define whether two parties are talking about the same things, and identifiers are one way of, of, of um, making that happen. Smart infrastructure, things like smart grid, BIM master technology, we've talked about that certainly goes in there. A little bit closer to the 3D space is the in integration of indoor and outdoor. And obviously there's an OGC um, group on, on, on indoor GML where, where this comes out. And I think quite generally, um, these geospatially aware smart cities are about exploiting spatial relationships. So the benefits that information integration can bring are providing better access to information, then doing analytics based on these, um, yeah, based on these data, um, the ability to simulate things in much, much more, much, much more detail, and then to have a feedback loop to give a steer to change things in the real in the real world to optimize processes and systems and the use of resources. So what we need is a data integration platform, right? We need something where all this information can come together. And some of you will have seen this slide before because it's the slide that we've used in the CityGML community, I think, for the, at least the better part of, of 10 years. This is actually the slide that describes why we've created CityGML in the first place. And this is one of the core CityGML slides that says the motivation for creating um, a data model that describes the urban environment is to provide a data integration platform that would actually allow all these different use cases to operate uh, from one single data source, whether it's one single database that, 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 that I think can be, can be debated. So in case you haven't had that much exposure to CityGML to start with, um, just some two quick slides, a um, bit of a scope of what CityGML is. So it represents pretty much the, the built environment and a little bit more. So buildings are probably the most predominant part. Uh, we have something called city furniture, which simply means street furniture. Uh, we can group things, we can represent land use, the relief, we can add it, transportation information, vegetation, water bodies. Appearance means texture, so we can color things in nicely with photorealistic or other kind of other kind of textures. And what's perhaps more importantly, we have an extension mechanism in which you can add additional themes through it uh, to it, such as utility, 3D cadaster, um, noise simulation. The list is pretty much endless because um, we allow the communities to 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 um, to add um, additional items to it. And the idea behind, behind this way of working is that we're saying you should find something in the order of 80% in the standard itself. And if you're very, very interested in, in, um, in, in some specifics for your use case, you can easily, easily add them and create an, create an extension. 
This is all very structured data, and I think for foundation data, for reference data, particularly data that represents the built environment, that is probably the correct way. But that is also one part of looking at data, because there's an old host of unstructured data out there on the web and in other sources. And it would probably be quite desirable to also bring this in. So just a quick outlook on, on the description of, of one of the themes that we are working on in CityGML is to allow much, much more unstructured data through uniform resource um, indicators, URIs, to be brought into, into CityGML. So one of the, the ideas is that um, whilst we usually have um, represent um, an attribute value as a static value that sits in a, um, in a GML file, um, it should be possible to just point at a URI where we can pull in the value, the, the, the most current value or uh, the value influenced by some parameter um, in, a, in a dynamic way. So this is something that, that we want to make available um, in CityGML 3.0 um, within the next year, year and a half. That's kind of the simple slide in a way that describes CityGML. And um, there are two good things about this, and perhaps about CityGML in general. A, it looks quite good, and B, it's not too difficult. So we can represent buildings, which, as you've seen before, is really only a subset of what CityGML brings, in a variety of different ways, which are called LODs, or levels, levels of detail. From Simple building footprints to still quite simply extruded buildings into roof shapes with kind of a little bit more fancy things on, onto them in LOE3 um, into, the, into the interior of buildings. And the point I would like to make is that smart city is not necessarily or shouldn't necessarily be characterized by saying the more you can do, the better the smart city or the better the 3D virtual environment actually gets. I think there's a lot that can happen and should happen toward the left-hand side of this diagram. And I think the current sweet spot for 3D is probably somewhere between LOD1 and LOD0. And there's quite a simple reason for that. And the reason is that creating LOD3 or LOD4 data, in particular to maintain it, is A, quite costly, and B, nobody has really figured out how to do this um, sustainably over a larger, over a larger area. But towards the left side of the diagram, pretty much every city, pretty much every municipality in the world has some kind of LOD0 building footprint representation about, about the buildings in their, in their area. So we actually sit on a lot of data that can be exploited in a smart cities context, that can be exploited in a, um, in a 3D context. Um, with the 25 million buildings that Ordnance Survey um, enabled to be LOD, um, LOD1 in, in Great Britain alone, I think that should give you a bit of an indication that moving from LOD1, uh, sorry, LOD0 to LOD1 shouldn't be that difficult. And it's data that we, um, or it's additional information that, that we've made um, available without any kind of price increase. So um, building high data, I think, has gotten quite ubiquitous and very, 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 very cheap by now. So that's CityGML in a nutshell for you. So, to close, information integration in smart cities. Um, if we don't really know what a smart city is, it's really difficult to solve any kind of problem. Because it's a topic that's so wide that I think we're quite in danger of, of um, producing a lot, lot of hot air and a lot of discussion uh, without actually moving forward. So the simple suggestion behind this slide, and I acknowledge that it's not in, in, in great detail, but I would like wanted to, to, to leave it kind of um, a little bit open for, for interpretation, is that I think there are some, some areas in there that we can look at and perhaps focus on and um, solve quite, yeah, quite concrete um, problems. So I think there are a lot of opportunities, and I think perhaps the biggest opportunity is that um, outside of this geospatial industry, which sometimes feels a little bit insular, <coughs> that we have an opportunity here to talk people in agriculture, in the food business, in housing, in transport, in energy infrastructure, in environment, in um, resilience, in emergencies, to a much, much greater extent than we have done before. I think we've always done this to a certain extent, 
but have we really completely understood what these people are, um, are after? And the last point I would like to make is, is, is how we kind of pitch standards, because once we perhaps think that geospatial technology is incredibly powerful to solve all these issues, um, one of the particular problems that we have with, with CityGML, if you like, and um, George and I have discussed this over the, the last couple of weeks, is that we offer something that is quite generic, that can be used in a variety of different, um, different ways, but we don't make it really completely easy for people to use a standard or a technology like that. And perhaps if we would think a little bit more, let's say, <coughs> virtual or with, with, um, with a standard as being much, much more like a, like a product, um, we can probably start solving that. And there's kind of a role that um, for standards, particularly uh, not only in OGC, but that, that's obviously the community we are, we are in today, that's kind of missing is kind of the notion of a product manager. And that product manager, I think, would, would basically help translating how a standard can be used in kind of any of these environments, um, any of these particular use cases that you can, you can actually drill down into um, in, much, much, in much, much greater detail. So with that, um, I hope that got you thinking a little bit. And thanks for listening. Sorry, I was started late, so I didn't know who um, I've probably got time at this point for one question. So Scott was the first up with a hand. So, yes. <laughs> so going to, the, to that last slide, each of these data sources has an independent owner, an independent life cycle, perhaps a different diversity of stakeholders. Who ensures that all these integrated components survive? the independent life cycles and remain working for a smart city. You're speaking from the perspective of the National Mapping Agency, but <coughs> how, does this, how does this mechanically actually occur? I think we have to realize that information is coming together from a variety of different sources, that we need to be quite clear about who owns data, so that there's an awful lot of data custodianship in this. So, from a simple on its own perspective, the answer is probably quite, quite, quite simple in terms of everything that we kind of collect, where we feel or are seen in the marketplace as being the authoritative data provider, we will just take care of. But the picture is obviously a lot more, a lot more complicated. And I try to make the point that collaboration between different, um, not only agencies but different players is is really quite important. And we need to recognize that the data comes together from a variety of different sources. And, well, I guess as a matter of principle, the organization or wherever data originates from is probably the best place to maintain the data going forward. Whether this organization will always want to do that, whether this organization is always capable of doing this, um, this is where it can get really, really complicated. So I think rather than just waiting for this to magically come together, the suggestion is that we need to start somewhere, pick out a few use cases, try to make it work, and then hopefully others will jump on the bandwagon. <laughs>